Welcome to the fourth and final part of the Daniel and Revelation video collection. I am Jody Stoddard, and these are insights from the perspective of a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. If you missed the first three, you need to go watch those first because we are creating a giant puzzle with a lot of different pieces. And if you don't have the pieces from the uh, previous three videos, then you aren't going to understand what's going on. So it'll be a lot more meaningful for you if you go and watch those first. But welcome back, and I hope that you gain new insight and enjoy the video. Thank you. At the end of the last video, video number three, we had talked about wheat harvest and we had also mentioned grape harvest. So we need to talk now about the pattern of the harvest. And this is an essay that was put together by Bob Canning. And I am grateful that he said that I could use this. Um, it's amazing. So this helps us understand the actual pattern of the harvest, the harvest cycles and seasons in Jerusalem. The church seems to have been following the Jewish harvest pattern to date. From Joseph Smith to Brigham Young, we have the barley harvest. Barley is the first fruit characterized as weak, susceptible to damage from spring frosts, just like the early church was susceptible to damage as Joseph restored it. With Brigham Young, we entered the wheat harvest. This is the majority of the growing season for the church. It lasts the longest and finishes up at the beginning of the grape harvest with the wheat offering in the temple. And remember, we talked about the wheat offering that was made on the new altar of the Jews in December of last year, uh, December 2018. There were some pretty significant timing with the wheat offering and what just happened in the last April conference of 2019 as well. But the wheat and the tares grow together. The majority of the growth of the church happens during this time, and so do the secret combinations. When President Thomas S. Monson changed the missionary age, we entered the hastening of the work, or the hastened harvest. This is where the wheat is being laid up in store by some workers, and all of the workers are waiting for the Lord of the vineyard to come and tell them it's time to harvest the grapes. This was called the hastened harvest because it had to happen fast or the grapes would turn. We're nearing the end of this phase by his estimation and the hastened harvest is winding down. And he wrote this in September of 2018. When the hastened grape harvest comes to an end, it was also about time for the wheat offering in the temple. So you have the wheat offering, the winding up of the grape harvest and the beginning of the olive harvest all overlapping each other. And this is where he said we were in his estimation. Now, since then, March and April of 2020, I think that we have seen that happen, and we'll explain that later. The next harvest, the olive harvest, is about to kick in with a mighty shaking. The earth has already been ramping up. The olive harvest was characterized by shaking the trees to get the olives out. This is the part where the Lord preaches his own sermons shakes the earth or the olive trees and collects the last people who will hear his voice. The trees are violently shaken to get the olives to fall so they can be gathered. All of the members of the church will be gatherers because it will be unsafe to have missionaries serving outside of their homes. This is the tribulation and the cleansing of America. The tribulation is also the time where these olives are put under immense pressure to extract the pure olive oil or a pure remnant that will build Zion. In his opinion, President Nelson and the other apostles during the April 2018, 20, 2019 conference put us on notice that we are leaving Egypt or Babylon and that the new law is coming quickly and that the wheat offering has been or is about to be made. The grape harvest is just about over and the olive harvest is ramping up. Why is this important? because the restructuring and changes that were made at conference 2019 and the ones that are coming in future conferences are to deal with meeting the needs of the members of the church and remaining, the remaining people that are to be harvested. This would mean that the day of the Gentiles will be over soon and Ephraim, or is now already, and Ephraim's responsibility is just about complete. The wheat harvest is ending and the wheat offering will be made to the Lord. Missionary work will take on a new meaning. 
all members will be gatherers during the tribulation as secret combinations and those who uphold them are destroyed and the remaining olives are harvested but more importantly as the olive harvest shaking occurs the people of the church need to do two things to survive one take care of each other two do their family history and temple work so that family on the other side can provide support as well as during the very turbulent times we need every worthy man woman and child on both sides of the veil to survive the battle that we are now entering into with lucifer and his followers he will be completely unbound and have free reign for a short but intense time again this was written in september of 2018 and since then much of what he was pointing to in his description of the various harvests have come to pass and we'll talk about that more toward the end of this video something that i hear often is the quote we know not the day nor the hour and when taken out of context that is only a half truth so we need to stop misusing this quote because as for the season year month and likely even the week we can know that is the purpose of signs and we can know that from scripture dnc 106 4 says and again verily i say unto you the coming of the lord draweth nigh and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night Therefore, gird up your loins, that ye may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief in the night. Mark 13, 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when her branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye, in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the door. 1 Thessalonians 5. But ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief ye are the children of light and the children of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness elder bruce r mcconkie added further insight to the meaning of this passage when he said those who treasure up his word will not be deceived as to the time of that glorious day nor as to the events that precede and attend it the righteous will be able to read the signs of the times to those in darkness he will come suddenly, unexpectedly, as a thief in the night. But to the children of light, who are not of the night, nor of darkness, as Paul expressed it, that day will not overtake them as a thief. They will recognize the signs as certainly as a woman in travail foreknows the approximate time of her child's birth. Again, remember, he will be here multiple times prior to the official second coming. If we are aware of or find out our mission and we're doing what we're supposed to be, we will likely already know he is here preparing the world and his kingdom for his return in his glory. All right, moving forward, we're going to talk about the bridegroom and the bride and what that symbolizes and also the wedding feast and the wedding and um, getting ready for all that stuff. And remember the changes that we had in January of 2019 as you go through these as we go through these um, Hebrew traditions so that you can learn more about our own temple experience and how that has changed. Um, anciently there wasn't always handwritten invitations given out instead they were verbal and after a guest was invited they would change their robe or the side with a knot or clasp or pin on it to the other shoulder. So those doing the inviting would know that they had already been invited. Also, the removal of shoes was an ancient symbol of an agreement or a covenant. All right, let's learn about some of the Hebrew traditions around gathering for a wedding. From the book, Beloved Bridegroom, Finding Christ in Ancient Jewish Marriage and Family Customs by Donna Burkhalter Nielsen, this is a synopsis mostly taken from chapter four the book was used as a reference and i'm not sure who put this together um but i thank them for it and if they want to let me know who it is i'd be happy to note them in my references anciently when a groom wrote the ketubah the terms of marriage agreement for his intended bride and when she accepted he gave her a costly gift that had cost him all a gift that he had earned with his own labor at that point, the couple entered into an approximate one-year-long passage where they did not see each other at all. 
they were considered married and their engagement could only be broken by divorce during that year the bride remained in her father's home she busied herself polishing up her homemaking skills and making her wedding dress her bridal wardrobe perhaps she would make um, a prayer shawl for her husband and work on her genealogy just the kind of things that you would do getting ready to be married she would keep her ketubah near reading and rereading the promises her beloved had made and knowing what a high price he had paid for her she would depend upon his faithfulness knowing he would come for her when all was ready had he not given all to claim her hand she kept a candle burning at her window each night of their separation so you're thinking about this the bridegroom is christ the bride is the church so remember those analogies as we go through this the groom returns to his father's home and begins construction on a room to be added on to his father's home a bridal chamber where he would bring his new wife the groom did not carry out the construction alone usually he had friends help him no um all of it was done under the supervision of his father after all his father had a reputation to keep and only the most carefully constructed structure would do in fact the marriage could not proceed until the son received approval from his father that all was completed to his father's satisfaction only then could he collect his wife and only then could the wedding celebration proceed the key to this was the friend of the groom in most cases um, it, I look at this maybe as being the prophet who would bring news back and forth from the church to the groom or in other words from the groom to the bridegroom sorry from the groom to the bride and so this friend went back and forth and telling what the other one was doing that maybe foundation had been dug and the walls were being raised and the roof was installed and likewise he would go to the bride in return with news that she um, was working on her beautiful wedding gown or perhaps he would bring the groom a loaf of bread she had made as the time and clues were given by the friend of the groom grew near the bride would pack all the things she had carefully gathered for their new home pack her clothes be washed and anointed in readiness for the coming of her beloved bridegroom her greatest gift to her future husband was her personal purity and readiness and willingness to grow their own kingdom her friends would gather around her in anticipation of the happy event finally the day came and after careful inspection the father now gives his son approval the bridal chamber is complete and acceptable in every way in his father's eyes all the constraints that have kept them apart now fall by the wayside he can now collect his bride and the wedding can begin in essence the father just handed off the baton to his son for an entire unspecified period of time both the groom and both the groom and his bride have been accountable to the groom's father in essence in approving the wedding chamber the father is handing the baton off he is no longer accountable the son is no longer accountable to his father in how to conduct his new kingdom he has earned his father's complete trust all is done it is done well hence the groom becomes lord and king of his own kingdom likewise the bride comes out from under the stewardship of the father through the stewardship of her future bridegroom to become the queen of this new kingdom they are no longer children in need of constant supervision they have learned what they need to know they are equals before the father and they together are now poised to become one within a few nights time still to be determined the bridegroom will come there is much to be done within a very short space of time to prepare the final celebrations but finally he will come with his friends sounding the shofar in the darkest part of the night to surprise and claim his bride she will be born on an aperion litter to her new home so again this is not the official second coming this is a precursor this is when he comes to take her um, or comes to get the righteous for the wedding feast again remembering the five wise virgins and the five unwise virgins since the procession begins late at night and since the bridegroom walks the streets gathering guests on the way to the bride it took some time a messenger would run ahead to warn the people that he was coming perhaps he would arrive at 11:55 p.m or perhaps he wouldn't arrive until 12:01 a.m which would be the next day thus they didn't know the day or the hour 
The same can be said of a woman that travaileth in labor, symbolism which is frequently used to describe second coming events. A woman may go into labor on a certain morning, but not give birth until the next day. We know the baby is coming, but we don't know the day or the hour. And in these scriptures, again, we can see the bridegroom coming for the bride happens somewhere in the middle. The wedding feast takes place before the official second coming. So if we read these scriptures, let's see what that looks like. DNC 8895. And there shall be silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. And immediately after shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded, as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up. And the face of the Lord shall be unveiled. So there we have the half hour of silence ending in the middle of the tribulations when the Lord comes. And who does he come for? 96. And the saints that are upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened, translated into terrestrial beings, and caught up to meet him. So there again, we have that mid-tribulation event that's going to happen when the Lord will be there and the saints, the 144,000 or whatever saints are ready, will be quickened, translated, and taken up. 97. And they who have slept in their graves shall come forth, for their graves shall be opened, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. 98. They are Christ's, the first fruits, they who shall descend with him first. So here we have reference to the first fruits, the church of the firstborn, those who shall come with him in the clouds when he descends in his glory. So this is not the time when he descends in his glory. This is a previous event. So let's talk about the spiritual symbolism of veils. And Heather Farrell has a link, and I put that at the end in the references. She does a, a really beautiful article on the symbolism of veils. So I'm taking a few words from her article. The practice of women wearing veils is found repeatedly throughout the scriptures, and for a good portion of human history, it has been common for women, and sometimes men, to veil their heads and faces. Today, in many religions around the world, not just Islam, women still cover their heads and faces when they are in the presence of people not of their family and or during religious ceremonies and practices. It is a tradition steeped in powerful religious symbolism and one which Satan has done a good job of misconstruing. Today, many people see a veil as an indicator that whatever is being veiled needs to be protected from outside influences because it is weak, unimportant, or should be controlled. For example, there are people in the world who argue that women need to be veiled in order to protect them from men and their lusts. Or in a similar vein, there are people who see veils as a way to keep something secret, hidden, and untouched. Yet the truth is that such interpretations of veils are exactly the opposite from what they really symbolize. The reason you veil something is because it is powerful, and the veil is to protect those outside of it from the power beneath it. In Exodus 34, we read how Moses came down from the mountain after speaking face to face with God, and his, his face shone so brightly that the children of Israel were afraid to be in his presence. He had to veil his face while talking to them because they could not look upon him. Yet Moses did not veil his face when he talked to God, only when he spoke in front of the congregation. Verse 33 and 34 says, And Moses had done speaking with the children of Israel, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. So Moses wore the veil when speaking to the children of Israel after having spoken to the Lord, but he did not veil himself when he was speaking to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3 also explains that one of the reasons Moses failed his face in the front of the children of Israel, but not before God, was because Israel was not yet ready for the power and knowledge that Moses possessed, but that when Israel shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 14 says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Doctrine and Covenants 101 says, 
that God himself wears a veil. Verse 22, Behold, it is my will that all they who call on my name and worship me according to mine everlasting gospel should gather together and stand in holy places and prepare for the revelation which is to come when the veil of the covering of my temple in my tabernacle which hideth the earth shall be taken off and all flesh shall see me together. So the veil, which we often think of as being over the earth, is actually over God. God is the one being veiled because the earth is not yet ready for the knowledge and power he possesses. Also note that a woman unveils her face at a wedding ceremony to show that, he, that she has accepted all that the bridegroom has prepared for her and that she trusts him and is ready to give herself to him completely. So again, I hope that you could see some of the symbolism in our temple from the year 2019 and apply that. So that was all the information that I shared at the, 20, the February 2020 fireside. And since then, a lot has happened, especially in the month of March. So I wanted to add some slides here at the end in addition to what my original fireside had been. There's a prophecy that the missionaries would be called home and the Lord would preach his own sermons. Brigham Young said, Do you think there is a calamity abroad now among the people? Not much. All we have yet heard and all that we have experienced is scarcely a preface to the sermon that is going to be preached. When the testimony of the elders ceases to be given and the Lord says to them, Come home, I will now preach my own sermons to the nations of the earth. All you now know can scarcely be called a preface to the sermon that will be preached with fire and sword, tempest, earthquake, hail, rain, thunders, and lightning, and fearful destruction. What matters the destruction of a few railway cars? You will hear of magnificent cities now idolized by people sinking into the earth, entombing the inhabitants. The sea will have heave itself beyond its bounds, engulfing mighty cities. Famine will spread over the nations, and nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and state against state, in our own country and in foreign lands. That was Brigham Young from the Journal of Discourses, Volume 8. President Heber C. Kimball said, The judgments of God will be poured out upon the wicked to the extent that our elders from far and near will be called home. Or in other words, the gospel will be taken from the Gentile and later on will be carried to the Jews. Orson Pratt, when God has called out the righteous, when the warning voice has been sufficiently proclaimed among the Gentile nations, and the Lord says, it is enough, he will say to his servants, O ye my servants, come home, come out from the midst of these Gentile nations, where you have labored and borne testimony for so long a period, come out from among them, for they are not worthy, they do not receive the message that I have sent forth, they do not repent of their sins, Come out from their midst, their times are fulfilled. Seal up the testimony among them and bind up the law. Orson Pratt, Journal of Discourses, Volume 18. So in March, we have seen our missionaries called home. I don't know if that's permanent or if they will go out again before the tribulations begin in earnest. Already we know that foreign missionaries will stay in their native countries and will no longer go out from there. And as far as Canadian and U.S. missionaries go, they may still be called on foreign missions as of the first week of April. But whether or not that will hold will depend on what the future brings. Daniel prophesied that the temples would close as does a verse in Revelation. Daniel 12, 11, And from the time that the daily sacrifice or temple worship shall be taken away, and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. The abomination that make it desolate would be that three and a half years or the great tribulations. Something happened in June of 2018 that caused me to believe it might qualify as the setup time. When adding 1290 days or three and a half years, we come to the end of 2018. But the temples didn't close then. 
Instead, there were some wonderful changes. Symbolically, we left the Aaronic robes and the telestial world, and we went straight to the Melchizedek robes and the terrestrial millennial world. I believe this symbolized the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, had come for the bride or the church. But weren't the temples supposed to close at the end of 2018 if those dates were right? Well, there is another scripture we need to look at and add in here. Daniel 9.27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one year, and in the midst of the year he shall cause the sacrifice and ablation, or temple worship, to cease. So the covenant was confirmed for a year. Our temple changes beginning of 2019 through the end of 2019, and then starting with the Salt Lake Temple and other pioneer temples in December of 2019, a year after the covenant was confirmed, the temples began to close. Soon because of COVID-19, a cascading closure of temples happened until March 25th. It was announced that on March 26th, the temples would not open and that they would be completely closed for all ordinances, living and proxy. Daniel 9.27 continues, And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Is that a sign that we are moving from the time of troubles to the day of Jehovah? So are we moving from the first half of the seven years of tribulation to the second half? Some say that March 26, 1820, was the actual date of the first vision based on weather reports for that year. If so, then exactly 200 years to the day after the first vision, the temples closed, just as Daniel prophesied. The date was also exactly 400 years from the Mayflower landing at Plymouth Rock, those people who were seeking religious freedom. Not a coincidence. Have the doors to the wedding feast just symbolically closed? And if so, how long until the wedding begins? Another event that happened was Utah had an earthquake and Moroni's trumpet fell. On March 18, 2020, Utah had a quake which dislodged the trumpet from Moroni's hand. Amos 3.14 says that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel, remember we are Israel, Upon him I will also visit the altars of Bethel, which is a holy place, and the horns or trumpet of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. It's also noteworthy that all the spires from the Salt Lake Temple, which is under remodeling and reconstruction, are being removed. In Amos verse 6 we read, Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? A lot of people just think this is a coincidence and even laughed at it, but I don't think so. The header of the chapter for Amos says, Because Israel rejects the prophets and follows evil, the nation is overwhelmed by an adversary. So here we are, with our temples closed, the day of the Gentile ending, the trumpet is no longer sounding to them as the missionaries have been called home, and God warned it would begin in his house. During the April 2020 General Conference, we did the Hosanna Shout. Was this a prophetic event? Revelation 8.1 says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour. So this is where we are right now. We are nearing the end of the about half an hour or 20 to 21 years of silence. Verse 2, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So as we finish reading these next few verses, again, consider, is this a solemn assembly that we had on Sunday, April 5th? Verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints, upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So President Nelson, think of his hand as he offered the Hosanna shout. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fires of the altar and cast it into the earth. So the fire and the ash from the sacrifices and offerings represent a plea for the repentance from sin. 
And if you go back and listen to the choir singing the Hosanna anthem and the spirit of God like a fire is burning and understand the ancient temple rites and what they did in the temple, then I think literally what we are seeing here is a Hosanna shout. And then after that shout, the seven angels, which had the seven trumps, prepared themselves to sound. Now we need to find out what those seven trumps represent. If the Hosanna shout of April 5th, 2020 represented Revelations 8, 2 through 5, we shall know soon enough as we see the seven plagues of the seven angels poured out from the rest of Revelation 8 and 9. Many scholars believe that these prophecies of the seven angels in Revelation 8 and 9 are the same as from Revelation 15 and 16, as the descriptions of what is to be poured out is almost identical, and I tend to agree. And if that's so, Revelation 15, 8 says, And the temple was filled with smoke, the prayers from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. If the temples temporarily reopen, then this scripture will happen after they close a second time. But we can tell now the temples are closed. So either we are entering the seven angel time period where those plagues and disasters will be poured out, or we will have a reprieve where the temples will open temporarily. But we know from both Daniel and Revelation that the temples will close during the worst of the tribulations. So it's going to be a wait and see what happens next. But if you want to study up and read on what those plagues and tribulations are from Revelation 8, 9 and 15, 16, then as they start to happen, you will know because you'll know what to be looking for. And then Isaiah 13 mirrors Revelation 8. So it sounds again here like this is also describing a Hosanna shout. So Isaiah 13, 2. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand. So wave the palms. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdom of the nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. So again, is that describing the Hosanna shout? And then when you go on in Isaiah 13, it goes on and describes the plagues and turmoil that will happen in the Great Tribulations, just as Revelation 8 and 9 do. So are we the hosts that the Lord just mustered as the hosts of the battle? Are we moving into the Great Tribulations? Remember earlier when we talked about Ezra Taft Benson's talk and he said that those in attendance in April of 1981, 40 years ago, were those who would usher in the second coming. Now here's Ronald A. Rasband, April 2020 conference. He has a comment here and then he quotes President Nelson. We are the people tasked with ushering in the Lord's second coming. President Russell M. Nelson has called this the greatest cause and the greatest work in the Lord's kingdom today. And I want to add my voice to that. I believe that we are here. And I hope that this does not bring you the kind of fear that will immobilize you, but instead the fear of the trust in the Lord and that will put you, that will mobilize you, but with the fear that's the type, that's a respect, that type of fear. So a respect for the Lord in moving forward and preparing and finding out what it is you're supposed to do. What's your mission? Look at the incredible promises 
that President Nelson gave us in the talk that we went over with the scriptures that he talked about and all of those wondrous things that the people of the winding up scenes have the opportunity to be a part of. So we need to find out what our mission is and be ready to move forward as the Lord directs. Thank you for spending your time with me. I'm grateful that you listened. My biggest prayer is that it helps you move forward in faith and peace and excitement because Jesus is coming back. And I say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here are the resources and links from the all four parts of this video series. If you have any questions or if there's some that you don't see here that you wanted, just let me know. Thank you. Blessings to you and your family.